So today I catch up with someone I worked with, I think nearly 20 years ago, and I'll explain that. Uh, Gayla Kresh Hartzow. Hartso. Um, and uh, Gayla and her company came into where I was working at the time, Telstra. And I was sitting there going, oh, no, here we go. Another, another consultant coming in and stuff like that. But I was actually blown away with what they did. They did this activity analysis. But it wasn't just capturing what people was, were doing. It was actually the understanding of that and how it was all presented. So um, uh, I've always kept in touch with Gayla and watched what she's done from afar, based in LA, California. Um, just a little bit, and I'll, I'll let Gayla explain this to herself, but apart from being a consultant, um, she's a writer and producer um, and has a very interesting start to her career out of college, and I, I'll get you to explain that. But the one thing I want to say to you is, so in preparation for this interview, I went back and watched Slap. And... <laughs> Oh, my goodness. So slap, short film, seven minutes long. They need to play that in Congress at the start of every sitting is what I think, right? It is, I just I just went, whoa, right? It, it, it actually slapped me when I watched that. So, folks, I'll put up a link. I think it, it's up on YouTube, and um, you gotta, you got to watch this short movie. It won Best in the Fest, Audience Awards, all these sorts of things. It's it's. How long ago was that? So I actually made that in about 2010, 2011. And it is, I mean, it uses comedy to talk about our inability to have civil discourse in the world today. Um, so um, it'd be great for you to share it with your viewers. Um, <laughs> so by all means, make the link available, or if you need another link, I'll send it. But the other thing is, it's so relevant today, you know? Yeah. You know, more than 10 years later, it's it's just, it just hit me like, wow, this is what we're talking about today and how we're reacting in fact. So anyway, um, so that's great. Uh, you've now done a lot of work across organizations, strategy, planning, um, done a lot of work with the public sector, which we'll get into. And you're not scared of the big problems from what I can see. So, you know, from healthcare to, you know, redistricting of, for elections and and then also helping the underprivileged as well. So I've said too much already, but Gayla, uh, welcome. And please, please give us a little bit of your background and your journey to start. Okay, since you asked about the journey, uh, when I graduated from Northwestern, I was very socially conscious, wanting to make the world better. I went into Vista and in the United States, there's a very rural area called Appalachia. It's sort of like some of your mountain regions that you have um, north of Melbourne. Worked there for a year. I was an educator in my 20s. Um, I basically got four university degrees. I finished my PhD and suddenly realized I had the wrong degree. And I got a postdoc where I got to work with a think tank in Washington, D.C. on higher education policy and developing countries. And I thought I died and gone to heaven because they were paying me to do research I would have done free as a faculty member in hopes that maybe someday it got published and even greater hopes that someday someone would read it. But as a management consultant, they were paying us to do the studies, they were reading the reports and we were making change. And it was pretty exciting to be in your late twenties and realize what kind of a social impact you had in terms of open enrollment, increasing access for minorities and others. Um, I then decided in my thirties that I thought the private sector probably was smarter about how to do things. And I went to work for a large international firm and it was exciting in the sense that I developed a lot of new tools. Um, I actually got to work for Qantas, made 24 trips to Australia. I considered Australia my second home because the country welcomed me so nicely. Uh, and it was a great learning experience. I was transferred from Washington DC to LA, worked for the big firm for three more years, and then decided to start my own firm like an experiment, almost like a game. Could I make it happen? That was 1986. So we've been in business now 37 years. So the game is working. Um, and it, part of the thinking was I wanted to get back to my heart and soul of social change. And so I began to pitch that we could apply 
public private sector concepts to the public sector. So in the beginning, we were doing a lot of work on right sizing, um, both for private companies and for government agencies, because there were recessions, there were earthquakes, there were lots of issues going on. Um, around 2000, Los Angeles County mandated that every county department have a strategic plan. So we really began to shift our work to strategy. And that was really an exciting shift, much more interesting, as you know, Rob, than doing right sizing and watching organizations having to lay off people. Um, this was really thinking about the future. Um, over the years, we have done strategic plans for over 30% of the county departments and over 60% of them bring us back for more work. Mm. We've been on, I've been on the faculty at the University of Southern California now. I think it's going on almost 10 years. And they brought me in and I brought along other officers of our firm because they felt their students were getting the theory, but not really how you implement, how you really make change, change happen. And in the change process, I really wanted to sort of talk about you because we have a lot of um, boots on the ground. You know, and I think what you experience in Telstra is we're not the kind of consultants that you bring in to gather a lot of data, crunch the numbers and tell upper management, this is what you do. We're much more involved in engaging the very managers who have to implement the change and understanding the analytics, thinking through the options and developing a comfort level in terms of what the change would be. So do you want me to go into that some more or is that enough of a little intro? Well, before we, we, we are going to go into that some more. Okay. Along the way, because you're a very interesting person. So along the way, what were the challenges? What were the highs? What were the lows? You know, you're in your 30s. You got, I'm going to do, play, do this experiment or do, you know, as a game or something. So what were the highs and lows as you got into that? Yeah, I think probably... The most interesting challenge for me in the 80s was being a, usually the only woman, you know, on teams and um, sort of having to make my own way because there were not other role models to make, if that makes any sense. Um, and especially like in Australia, because I was working down there for three years and they gave all the men on the team um, unlimited days to work in country. But New South Wales gave me one month because you didn't have an EEO requirement at the time. And the CEO, Qantas, was sort of saying, Gayla, why didn't you get the same work visa? And I said, and then somebody in the room said, because they treat girls differently. And I had to sort of correct them that it was doctor girl. Um, you know, but in those days in Australia, they would call us girls. Um, and Qantas was wonderful. They said, we'll just fly you out of the country every month because you have unlimited re-entries. So I got to see a lot of the world. I got to pop over to New Zealand on weekends, go up to Hong Kong, go to Indonesia, what have you. Um, so the CEO made it work. Um, but I think being the only woman in the room mm -hmm. oftentimes and making sure, I think there was a feeling that you had to sort of blend in with the furniture, blend in with the men. And what I learned after I started my own firm that companies were actually interesting, interested to know that I was a different personality, that I had my own um, style and that my style was very different and that it was much more open and much more willing to share what we're finding, what are some options we're thinking of. And it was a different kind of a, a approach. And I found it's worked well for me over the years. Mm -hmm. Um, we'll talk about your work. that comment about gender. <laughs> it Pardon? seems so interesting. Maybe not. I don't know if you expected that response about gender, but. Uh, I, I think it's um, when I was talking to Laura Mason, which is another interview, you know, she she worked in IT and, and similar, she had a similar sort of comment, right, yeah. coming into that. Um, I also have a daughter you know, who's been working in, she, she's a lawyer working in the UK and, you know, they're still in some professions. And I mean, it's not just professions, it's still everywhere, you know. Um, we're going to talk about diversity and, and what you put on your website is not just diversity by gender, it's by wow. everything else. 
Everything and else. the fun I've had here working in Asia Pacific is it's so diverse, right? Yeah. And and it's just it's just really good. And two teams I've built here, you know, we we've um, not many are, are like me, male, pale, and stale, right? They're um, they're very uh, yeah, we have them from all the different countries, and we need different countries, different languages, all that sort of stuff. So, you know, through that, it, it just brings such a richness. It brings different ideas. And it one has. of the things we've done here is in our interview process, the final step is the candidate has to present to the entire team. And what I have found is I have my perspective of that candidate. But afterwards, we discuss, right? And the candidates allowed to ask whatever questions they want of any one of the team and vice versa. Um, and after we discuss, and they bring such different views, different perspectives, and I've gone, oh, I hadn't thought of that. Um, and I think we had a really good success rate in hiring because of using diversity, right? So anyway, I'm on my hobby absolutely. horse. No, what, absolutely what uh, any aha moments along the way? You mentioned kind of some of that where, and this is where you and I connected in the first place, which was people weren't getting into the man, talking to the managers and working out how to do things. What were the aha moments along the way for you? Um, I mean, I would actually say my bigger aha moments had to do with what interesting work we could find, you know? So I started a firm, very few women owned firms in 1986. Um, I had a, I had actually my old boss from my old firm and another woman from one of the big accounting firms joined me right away. And you write a business plan and you have ideas of what market segments and all of that. But we sort of decided not to be a boutique firm. We decided we, among the three of us, we had different industries and we had different areas of practice. So we did set ourselves out as a general management consultant, consulting firm, despite everyone else's advice, which was be a boutique. Mm. And I think the big aha has been how we've been able to be nimble and adapt to how times change you know we weren't just doing one thing so we have some bench strength in very specific industries but we've worked in a lot of industries um, areas like strategy people management um, community social impact cut across a lot of different industries but I think the big aha was just who all we got to work with. I mean, we've worked with 200 clients. We've worked in nine foreign countries and we've worked in 48 states. I had no idea. I mean, those were the, probably the biggest ahas. Um, you mentioned redistricting. I had been approached during COVID. Um, there had been a new California Senate bill passed and LA County was mandated to change how they redrew the political boundaries for the board of supervisors who are over 10 million people, bigger than most countries. And in the past, the politicians picked whom they wanted to sit on this advisory group. The advisory group knew their job was to draw the lines to help get their politicians reelected. And it's, a it's also different by state too. So some have like a, a commission like yours to do that and other states have the legislature does it and it's very as far as a foreigner says very political is that right yeah, so this is a new trend shifting the united states most have always i mean gerrymandering in the united states goes back to the 1820s mm -hmm. so there were a couple of california put it in place in 2012 that it had to be done by independent citizens who had mm -hmm. no political connections okay and then they mandated it to some of the local governments in California. There's just a handful of states that have tried it this last election. They had some rough going. Michigan had a hard time. Virginia did a different thing where the politicians picked some, some were independent, and they got into fights, from my understanding. But what we did in LA County, there were 14 commissioners. Um, they applied um, the registrar recorder 
approve them as terms of being citizens and registered for voting and score their applications. They pick 60 highly qualified and they literally started picking them like you do a bing, uh, ping pong balls out of a little spinning thing mm -hmm, to identify mm -hmm. to be on this commission. We'll go into a lot more of the details, but we had to train them on the Voting Rights Act of the United States. You know, we had to bring in demographers. We had to really do a very different outreach approach because we wanted to reach all these grassroots groups whose voices normally hadn't been heard and really say, this is your opportunity to say what communities should come together that are like-minded, have a lot more commonality so you can choose the politician of your choice. And this was during COVID. Mm. So we were doing a lot of firsts. We were doing the first hybrid meetings. We were running public hearings virtually. Um, we were working with about 850 nonprofit organizations to get the word out. Um, we held the first public hearing in LA that was in Spanish and translated to English. Because usually it's in English and then the Spanish speakers. Mm -hmm. um, so we were doing just a lot of new and different things. And what is pretty remarkable is there have been no suits. The Board of Supervisors accepted it. It's been implemented. In contrast, this was L.A. County. In contrast, L.A. City has been in an uproar. They did the old-fashioned gerrymandering. People have gone to jail. People have lost their jobs. Um, and now they're looking to do this independent model. Are you being contacted for that? They've talked to me. So I read about this in, I think, the Kennedy School at Harvard Business University interviewed you over this. And yes. when you say you did a lot of firsts, I think that's a big understatement, right? <laughs> you were doing live, was it live YouTube meetings? Was it um, Are we live? Yes. Do you want to share some of the things you did to reach out to like those 850 yeah. separate bodies and, and to be as inclusive as possible? Yeah, so I don't know how much, I mean, some of this I'm sure translates to Australia. Um, in the United States, as most countries, you do a census and every 10 years you update it. And then based on the new census, they redraw the political boundaries, okay? Because people move around. And they did the census and COVID broke out. And they were also trying to do it for the first time where it wasn't a person going door to door, but people were doing it online. So Los Angeles County had a huge challenge because we had so many hard to count, hard to reach, mm -hmm. hard to find families, people living in garages in the back, you know, I can go on and on. So during census, they engaged about 850 nonprofits to help reach out and make sure people knew, weren't afraid to fill out the form and to be counted. So when we got the redistricting um, assignment, I had 50 emails of people interested. And I reached out to those 850 organizations that worked on census saying, this is the next piece. Mm -hmm. And I would meet with those grassroots groups monthly. I would talk about what we're thinking. You know, we had Common Cause, the Women League of um, Voters. We had all sorts of coalitions that were formed. And they would tell me, okay, if you do it this way, you might get a backlash this way. If you do this, we can help promote it. You know, so they were very helpful in terms of providing guidance throughout this process and getting the word out. You know, they would do some very creative things. Like we were very concerned about the digital divide, the people yes. who don't have access to a computer, how are they going to participate? And they would have potlucks at little community centers and they would set up the computer and the people would line up and give their public, you know, testimony. You know, we have over a hundred languages in Los Angeles County. And so they would oftentimes be there to translate, or we'd have our interpreters, you know, for Spanish and our other threshold languages. So there's a lot of creativity to try to get the word out. Um, mm -hmm. We also did a lot to engage faith-based organizations um, who also could get the word out. Yeah. Um, it actually started, there was controversy over the census in the first place because they wanted to stop it quickly and that was going to disenfranchise those hard to find people along the way i think yeah. so uh, they expanded the timeline but that then put a crunch on our end right and the time we had for yes. full analysis 
business and public engagement because we had to draw the lines by December 15th or it went to the courts and we met our deadline. Mm -hmm. So in Australia, the last two censuses have been online um, as well as I think paper. Two censuses ago, I actually logged in the day before um, and it let me do it and there was no wait and it, it was moved fine. And then on the day, apparently, there was a lot of problems. The most recent one, there was a very large denial of service attack and uh, brought the system down. So we're going through working out how to do this as we go through. But, you know, we often talk about yeah, especially elderly people, et cetera, you know, when you see everything going online these days, you know, and, you know, our health insurance and all these sorts of things, you know, if if people don't know how to use IT, it's, it must be getting harder and harder for them. So, um, and of course, we have many, many languages here as well. So I think we're quite used to that these days. Um I think it's amazing that you've come out of that with no lawsuits, you know, in, in such a litigious com country and all we hear about from overseas are, you know, everyone's suing everyone. Um, so what do you put that down to? I think because there was so much public engagement that it was so transparent and the to the Board of Supervisors' credit, I mean, they could send staff to the meetings. I know their staff were watching a lot of the recorded message, you know, recordings. Um, but I think it was not really an experiment because it was now law. This was going to be the way to do it, but we were doing it for the first time. Um, and so I, I, I think because it was so transparent and the Board of Supervisors accepted it. Um, yeah, so... And, and the county is a little different because a lot of what we had to do was educate people what the county did versus what the city did. A lot of people right. don't understand. And so they think of them as the same, where the city is only 4.2 million people and the county is 10 million. Mm -hmm. And the county, in pub, they do public social services, and they were serv servicing before COVID um, about 3 million, about 30% of the population. And we were brought in to do their strategic plan during COVID and their numbers increased to 40% of the county, 4 million people. And they were providing services to people who had never thought that they would need social welfare services in their mm -hmm. lifetime. Mm -hmm. But all of a sudden they needed CalFresh or food stamps. They needed, they were unemployed, you know. And so it was a whole other experience that was happening in the county in terms of people understanding, oh, the county does that. The county does public health. They do the vaccinations. You know, they do public social services. So the county, people began to understand, was different than municipal services for a smaller city. Yeah. I often, so here, I'm in Australia, worked for U.S. companies, and they see Australia huge landmass right yeah. and i say you kind of need to think of us like more like just california you know you know with similar sort of populations i think california's got slightly more you know so that sort of gdp that sort that's that's the size of us whereas and maybe this was my quota and budget negotiation tactics right but um i was trying to say no we're not we might be as large as america but you know we only have you know, high 20 million population. So you, you got to take that into, into a factor. So I think of California a lot from that perspective. Um, the, in terms of, you know, so that's great getting all that public engagement, but an observation is, you know, people only want to listen to the hit things they want to listen to and discount if it's not on the message they want to hear. Did, did you come across that? How, how did you sort of um, avoid biases or selective hearing going into that? Yeah, probably another recent project is a good example of that. Um, we were hired to see if it was the way to engage the faith-based organizations in the county to work in partnership with the county departments. And in the United States, there's a huge separation of church and state which I think you may be familiar, familiar with. Yep. We're not a church state per se. Um, 
And there was a lot of agreement among the faith-based organizations. Yes, we're serving a lot of the same indigent populations and we're providing food, clothing, job training, and it would be good if we could work in partnership. And actually COVID made the county even more aware of so many of these nonprofits that were delivering services mm -hmm. because they too began to work more collaboratively. Um, we did 13 listening sessions all over the county. And the idea was to bring in faith-based leaders of all different faiths to talk about the challenges. And the atheists and the agnostics went to all of the meetings in solidarity to make sure there was no violation of separation of church and state. And some of the faith-based leaders were put off. They said they shouldn't have been invited. It should, they're not a religion. They're not a faith. And we're like, we're open. It's transparent. We're here to listen. We'll give them their time. We'll give you your time. We're here to bring in all the input. Um, but that was, you know, clearly they were monitoring. Um, um, it's so important to get those different views in there for a number of reasons. It's important because we all have our, our, our own mental models and we're restricted by that. And, yeah. and, and they, they bring in that different perspective, which can lead to kind of aha moments. I remember I mentioned the interview process. We're doing an interview for South Korea. Mm. And I asked, you know, as you probably know, Australia, we're pretty sports mad and Melbourne, where I'm from, is very sports mad. And yeah, yeah. and so I actually asked the candidate, a um, Korean person saying, so what do you do on the weekend? And he didn't know how to answer that. And afterwards, my other South Korean um, part, people on the team said, Rob, he would have thought that's a trick question because he would think that you would be expecting him to say, well, I work on the weekend, right? Whereas I was expecting him to say, well, you know, I follow exactly. these sports teams, I go to the movies, et cetera, et cetera, right? So those different perspectives are so important, you know, when you can't Cultural. come into that. Yeah. I think the other reason is you actually have to do, get on those different views on the table perspectives somewhere in the process. Right, because if you don't do it at the start and all the work that you did, it'll backfire in the back end. Absolutely, and then you go around again, and hopefully not in the courts. Right, yeah. I know there's right. a case in front of the U.S. Supreme Court right now around gerrymandering. Mm -hmm. It's either in, it's one of the Carolinas, I believe, and Mississippi. Right, They're two states. Yes, so um, and and this is where they're trying to show that that uh, the lower courts said, no, that is gerrymandering, you have to redistrict. Um, yeah. And they're trying to argue against that and the way they could do it. What was interesting reading about it was you're allowed to gerrymander based on data but not based on race. And this is this is what I read in, in the article I was reading anyway. I, I, I'm a foreigner, so, you know. But we have it here too. Um Famously in Queensland, under a former, um, what you would call governor, we call premier of the state. So um, we do have it here too. So it's, but it's taken out of the hands of the politicians now. So we have a commission that does that. So hopefully that's fairer. Um, diversity. I'm interested in, you do a lot of work in, in the diversity, equity, inclusion space, right? What what sort of work? You, let's start with what sort of work are you doing? What are you finding? How are you handling that? Okay, so we see it as in context in terms of strategic change, and then how do you incorporate the people as part of inclusion and belonging? And obviously, then it has a huge social and community impact. Um, I'll mention one project we're going to be starting for the Department of Mental Health, which is really focused on. Um, training and development of Asian Pacific Islanders who are LGBTQ plus um, and to engage them in terms of what are their unique needs 
because the county mental health started realizing that they couldn't just have one solution for all for the cultural reason you mentioned when you talk to the Korean about what you do on the weekends, it creates a different kind of a sense. Um, We've also been hired by the California Department of Fish and Wildlife to work with their commission and how they can include, they call it JEDI, justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion into their decision-making process because they realized they were hearing from the same people. They were hearing from the hunters and the people who do the abacord scuba diving and you know the people who are engaged in terms of very specific initiatives, but they realized they were, again, hard to reach people who might be, let's say, Vietnamese fishermen who would have a viewpoint, but they didn't know how to access them. They did not know how to have their voices heard. So we're helping them to develop toolkits and ways to broaden their reach. Um, you know, I'll just mention on the redistricting, I said I started out with 50 emails without within two months, we had 9,000. You know, I mean, the, the ability to use social media and building on existing organizations networks are pretty powerful. So we'll be doing a, a lot of that kind of thinking for them as well. I would assume that word got out that you were actually listening. So it was worth connecting as well. No. In what way? Well, if, you know, getting emails, getting people reaching out, connecting with you to share, Yeah. well, if they don't think you're listening, if they don't think there's any point doing that, they probably wouldn't do it, right? So if you you actually, hang on, no, these people are, want to listen to what we have to say. They care. Yeah, you know, they need to hear. And the commissioners were wonderful. I was the executive director the 14 commissioners, when you talk about this process, it really renewed my faith in how really smart, common sense, aware, because it was a very diverse commission, Mm -hmm. you know, from, you know, in terms of sexual orientation, education, ethnic background, political party, age, you know, and go on and on, you know, and it was a wonderful cross section of Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I interrupted. Fishery. No, no, no. No. Um, you mentioned LA Door. It's a little bit of a different kind. We see, we see a lot of our outreach to underserved as part of this DEI kind of a thing. Mm-hmm. LA Door has been a project we've had for about five or six years. And the city attorney in Los Angeles basically had an aha moment who said, arresting people who are, because they're homeless, substance abuse, or mental health, and putting them in jail is not our best rehab uh, plan. And so it's a pre-booking diversion program. So if you're arrested for one of those reasons, the city attorney for the first time in history are partnering with public defender to help us sponge the records if they complete this LA door program. And the state has funded it. We are in our third cycle of funding because we've been able to generate the metrics to prove the impact uh, that it does make a difference. And we're teamed with Rand, and we're evaluating it. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's been sort of a labor of love. No, to it, see how um, it's especially mental health, um, LGBTQI. Did I get it right? Um, you know, and and for us, you still you know, when the pandemic hit here because of Australia's background and we're in in Asia, there was a lot of racism here in terms of blaming, et cetera, right? And, you know, I remember one, it was actually a nurse, you know, she was getting abused on the street telling us, and she said, but I'm from Korea, you know, like I'm, you know, um, so we see a lot more of that. Um, Something I just want to share with you. So a company I was with, they started these DEI groups, right? And this is this is personally just, I'm not so sure about doing that. And I did read some research on this where, you know, so they had um, black at, et cetera, et cetera, you know, um, LGBTQI at. And I'm going, but are we pigeoning whole people? And the one that hit me, and this is, they launched this in America, which was Asian at. And that actually hit me because yes, I'm not Asian looking, but I'm part I'm part of Asia Pacific, right? And I went, 
You didn't even talk to us for a start. And now we're pigeonholed into a group, right? Now they meant Asian American and I get all that, et cetera, et cetera. And I was, I've forgotten the name. I know his first name's John, but he's a black American living in London, gay, successful in businessman. And I was listening to a podcast of him and he's saying that one of the issues when you start creating these DEI groups is you're kind of, you're highlighting it more let, instead of this should just be part of who we are. Well, and I think that's more of our philosophy. Right. You know, which is not forming the subgroups. I mean, Los Angeles is very diverse to start. And so if you just look at pure numbers, uh, most of our clients have a good racial ethnic mix. So it really is getting into the sense of inclusion, um, the sense of belonging. Um, and if you look at sort of the intersectionality of, you know, the use of power versus various attributes that people have, mm -hmm. how do you make sure people know how to use their voices and their voices can be heard? Um, so a lot of the current work I would say with our clients is around a couple of areas in terms of like you figure out the strategy, then you, as you know, you need to figure out, do I have the right structure and the people and systems to execute that strategy, right? So a lot of it is around what I, we now call the developing leadership pipelines and really sort of developing the soft skills that people need, defining them and developing the soft skills that people need at each level. Because a lot of times people will feel, you know, I've been here for 14 years, I've been bypassed. It, it has to be bigot bigotry. You know, mm -hmm. you know, because I've been working hard, I've been doing my job, but no one has ever sort of sat down and said, here's some developmental needs you have to go to this next level. Um, and so we've been doing a lot of work around that and really sort of thinking through the inclusion component uh, a lot more. Yeah, I think you're right. You know, yeah. That building sort of, you know, when we talk about community impact, one can think about in terms of society, but every organization has to build a community, you build a team, you build a commitment to your mission, you build that sense that your ideas are valued, we need to hear from you. Mm -hmm. um, so it's more around that arena. There is a lot of work, like one of our um, senior consultants, his whole dis dissertation is on the immigrant population and how to make sure they feel integrated and also a lot of work around government workers and who's most stressed. And, you know, you're finding that the people who are more stressed tend to be minorities, you know, and black women. And, you know, so you start adding more of the attributes and sometimes a feeling of I'm the one that's always having to explain quote, my people, <laughs> you know, what mm -hmm. are the issues and all that? And I shouldn't be the single spokesperson on this, you know, and then it's draining mm -hmm. and people making stereotypic assumptions about where that person might be coming from based on the physical appearance versus what they really are about. Um, I, like, so, I like the emphasis on inclusion. I think you're absolutely right. Um, and we, we won't have time uh, today, but leadership development, you know, in in one of my, I think, chapter two, I talk about that in the videos that I've got up on my website. So, you know, a lot to do there. Um, what I want to just, one last question, then then we'll wrap up. But a lot of the stuff you talked, we've talked about, which is, you know, communicating broadly, pulling all that information. And we've talked about that in the sense of LA County and the work you've done there. How does that translate into the for-profit sector? What would be your advice and what work maybe you've done with the for-profit organisations in terms of that inclusion across or that inclusion collaboration right across the whole organisation? Well, I think you experienced and we were working with Telstra. So we had done a lot of work in the 90s and in higher education. And higher education is an incredibly engagement community. Mm -hmm. You know, you have to hear from faculty, you have to hear from students, you have to hear from the student affairs folks, you have to hear from the administration. And all of the ideas are very powerful voices that need to be balanced. 
And I've often felt that if you can consult and work in higher education, you can pretty much go anywhere. It's probably one of the more politicized work environments on earth. And so when we would work in the private sector, we would bring about the same kind of participatory um, input along the way in terms of the fact finding, making sure people understand the basis of the analysis. Um, and as you experience you know, more hands-on in terms of here are three or four options we've come up with, let's evaluate them together. Um, and from that usually emerges, if you have option A, B, and C, the, the rich dialogue comes up with LMNOP and option X, Y, or Z is the final one, you have a better outcome. Um, so we will always bring that component in. And I've had a couple of occasions where a private sector company will basically say, just come and tell us what to do. Mm -hmm. And I don't have any interest in doing that work. Mm -hmm. You know, because they have to own it. They have to implement it. I mean, one of the things we are doing now, which we did not do with Telstra, Rob, is the groups we work with, we make them present and pitch it to upper management. And we train them on how to present it. Um, we do dress rehearsals with them, you know, like you would with consultants are going to go and present to upper management. But we have found by them doing it, they own it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And the implementation is much easier than if, you know, I mean, we could probably do it as well, faster, more, you know, whatever. But that added time of that also is grooming them to become a leader and move up the chain. And I've seen many of them have gone through that process being positioned for that. Hmm. You just answered a number of questions that have popped into my head. So thanks for that along the way. Um, how reset? So, I often think about it's that kind of one layer down from the CEO, two layers down from the CEO. They seem to be the roadblock. They're the people that built their careers on not being collaborative or being in their functional silos, being doing what they've always done. How have you come across that as a as a roadblock? Is it receptive? Do you have a sometimes maybe a CEO above them saying, "Yeah, now that I'm CEO." My old ways are bad. What do we need to do? I mean, what what do you what do you find out there? Yeah, no, and I'll I'll just um, reinforce that in government, it's very siloed. Mm -hmm. It's very siloed. Um, and when you look from government agency to educational systems to private sector, it's even more siloed. Um, so, to me. It's important when we put together a work group, we do sort of a diagonal of the organization. So we include in the group the people who will be the executive champions, the middle managers who are going to actually have to implement the day to day, and then a lot of young new ideas coming in. And so we're doing a lot more of those cross sections. But the other thing I wanted to mention in terms of these silos is before COVID, we were doing oh, I guess four or five significant projects that were across um, governmental boundaries. And they would be, for example, we did one on building pathways from grade nine through college. And it included the Chamber of Commerce, private industries, city of LA, um, the Cal State Universities, and then LA Unified School District which is several hundred thousand students. And they were finding the students who went through the pathways um, and they were around career. So, you know, this is a, you know, health sciences pathway. This is a media arts pathway. This is, you know, there were like 18 of them they built at the time. And they were finding that the students who got into a pathway by ninth grade had a higher high school completion, matriculation to college and completion of a four-year degree. When they came out with jobs because they were all designed around areas that not only had jobs, but good paying jobs mm -hmm. at the back end. And I thought we'd be doing more of that kind of work, but then COVID happened. You know, I mean, we did another one that was five school districts working together on adult education. Um, you know, so there were more of that kind of um, pre-COVID, like how can we all work together to make this more seamless how can we all work together? And so we were doing a lot of that kind of work. And then we haven't seen it happening since. 
they're sort of like back into their governmental silos again. Interesting. Interesting. Um, so you've got the silos within the agencies. You have the silos. I know. <laughs> among all the agencies. And yet they all share the same common goal of helping residents to have a better quality of life. Yeah. All right. We're running out of time, Gail. It's been fantastic. We could talk for a lot longer. What would you like to leave the audience, the people watching this, you know, of all your experience and some of the great stuff we've talked about? What what would you leave? What message, what ideas would you like to leave? Um, well, one, I just want to toot your horn because of what you are doing, because you're helping to gather thought leaders from around the world and sharing them with a wider audience. And I think people have so much access to more information than obviously we have done, have had access in prior decades. And I think everyone should sort of take whatever pearls of wisdom might work for them and help to synthesize some of the best thinking that will work for them and experiment, be willing to innovate, be willing to try new things, um, make corrective, you know, course, you know, of action when things don't quite go how you want it to go, but always sort of have this longer term vision of where where you want to go, you know, whether or not it's, you know, trying to make the world better or it's just helping this company to grow and keep people employed and deliver services. Those are all wonderful things, but, you know, take the best of the thinking and make it your own. Thank, thanks for the the shout out. Appreciate that. And agree. At the end of my chapters on my book cast, I use the quote, if we don't change direction, we'll end up where we're heading. I saw that one. I loved it. <laughs> and um and the thing is that yeah, and I think the you know the younger generation coming through uh they they're not scared of saying, no, I'm not happy here. I'm gonna go and do something else, right? And I think that's great because that puts pressure on the whole system to to help break the status quo, right? So um, well, I was going to say that status quo is going to change because of the millennials mm -hmm. and the subsequent one. Plus, COVID changed everything: how we work, the workplace, um, the work cultures. You know, a lot of work around a hybrid work culture. It's a different kind of a manager, a supervisor today that's needed yes. in this kind. Of and it's made us so much more able to be international. I can talk to you in Australia while I'm here in LA. And all we have to do is work out the time zone difference. Which we it's now have of... tools online to do, which make it much easier. So that's all great. All yeah. right. Gaila, thank you very much. It's been great. Um, uh, I'm glad we've kept in touch all over the years. You know, and as you said, you know, there's all these interesting people over my career and I'm sure your career that you know have been great to circle back to and have these conversations so very much appreciate your time thank you thank you bye-bye